Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for staying here for what I believe is one of the most important talks of this conference. And um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce my good friend, Mr. Sanjay Purohit. First of all, I'll start by saying, Mr. Purohit is one of the most brilliant men I've met. He thinks at a global scale he, his background is that he worked in industry. He actually ran the consulting arm of one of the largest companies in India called Infosys Technologies, which has 250,000 employees, just to give you the scale of that operation. And um, in 2016, he stopped all work with business and decided to spend the rest of his life in making the world a better place to live, and he wanted to do it at scale. He works collaboratively with a Mr. Nandan Nilekani, who has been a major benefactor of ECHO and has supported our work in India since 2017. A large part of the success of our India project has been because the support from Mr. Nelikani and Sanjay Purohit and his team. Currently, Sanjay is the curator of something called societal thinking. So essentially thinking of, instead of thinking of the world as software which is designed to make profit, thinking of digital public goods like software or others that can enable the world to work more effectively and think at a level that we've never even at ECHO really thought of. And when we met with him, he encouraged us to think much bigger than we'd been thinking. In fact, um, we went to him with a goal of one billion people, and the response of him and Nandan was, this is too conservative. <laughs> so we are re really lucky to have Sanjay. He's in very high demand. He's Flying, he flew in this morning, and now he's going to fly back to New York this uh, in at midnight to um, meet with the Gates Foundation at 7:30, and then give a speech at the United Nations General Assembly. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Sanjay Purohit. Wow. Good afternoon, and such a privilege to be here amongst you. Sanjeev, as always, is very kind. And uh, it's his kindness that draws us to do our best with him and the entire Echo team. Very thankful to be here, privileged to be in your presence, and looking forward to this brief time that we have together. I'm also very humbled by the room, because obviously all of you are healthcare professionals, changing health spans of people, as well as improving lives, saving lives, something that I'm totally incapable of doing. So such a pleasure to be in your company and be of any service to all of you today. The topic that uh, was given to me to talk about is how do you drive exponential change using digital public goods? My background, uh, Sanjeev mentioned briefly, uh, but the industry background potentially is irrelevant, but what I've been doing since 2016 is drawing from the lessons of some very large-scale transformations that happened in India. Uh, some of you may be aware, we learned a lot from the National Identification Project whose aim was to give a trusted, reliable digital identity to a billion people. And today, that backbone, that infrastructure, is used by 1.3 billion people across the country. To think about it, to conceive it, to develop it, build it, roll it out, and help a whole society adopt something which was not a mandatory infrastructure, 
But for people to adopt it at will, we learned a lot of lessons. And the second wave that came after that was what's called the unified payments interface. India has a very unique payment backbone, which allows the movement of money for free. Would you all not want, potentially, to see how to move money at free? And so any amount of money can be moved around in India for free. And the most important part of that, it's extremely inclusive. Probably it's the only country where you can move money digitally without having a phone. And that is something that's potentially unconceivable in many economies, that if I don't have a phone, how do I make a digital payment? But in India, if you don't have a phone, you can still make a digital payment. <coughs> Excuse me. But in that process, we learned a lot of lessons. What does it mean to create inclusive technologies? What does it mean to take it to people who don't have the right infrastructure? What does it mean to serve people who need to be a part? And how do you move from very low volume, very large transaction mindset to very high volume, very small transaction mindset. Because when you want to include a billion people into development, then you have to be able to give them that possibility of ability to participate where they are in their context, in their situation. So we learned a lot of lessons. And as we were learning these lessons, and uh, my relationship with ECHO goes back to 2017 when Sanjeev uh, reached out saying, I have this aspiration to serve a billion people. And I said, yes, that's interesting. Let's get talking. And we started coming together and applying some of these thinking uh, in the context of ECHO and the other work that we do across climate, education, healthcare, so on. So when we applied this thinking to education, uh, we ended up building the education backbone of India which currently interconnects about 12 million teachers. And last 12 months, it has done about 6 billion learning sessions to build the capacity of teachers, right? In this process, we realized that our challenges, whether in health, whether in climate, whether in gender equity, are, are such that these challenges are not static challenges. They're constantly moving challenges. Of course, the pandemic suddenly fast-paced many things. But these are moving challenges, and they have a very exponential character. They multiply. They don't grow linearly, steadily, because they are very highly interdependent, interconnected systems. And so if you have to deal with them, we have to deal with them with an exponential thinking. So that brought us to this question saying, what is exponential? And obviously, we didn't want to suddenly become mathematicians with formulas of n squared, 2 to the power n, log tables, this, that, and the other. Because if you look at the curve of how ECHO has grown over the last few years, that's, by the way, an exponential curve. If you look at how it has really, the number of ECHO clinics and the number of sessions, the number of participants, you look at any graph, it's an exponential graph. But we said we need a more working definition of exponential rather than the mathematical definition of exponential. And so we started working with this construct called how do you create change that creates more change? Because something that creates itself has the ability to multiply. So change that creates more change. And let's reflect on ECHO. So before ECHO, if I was in some village of India or some village of Africa, I was in Kenya recently, and uh, we were looking at how do the healthcare professionals learn before ECHO, then probably they would get some pamphlets and some instructions and some booklets to learn from or probably go to some episodic training somewhere which has been happening uh, to go and learn about what besides their qualification and education. But after ECHO, you have this ability to participate in something which is more contextual, uh, connects you to a larger world, and it's a change. It's a change in the way I learn. So instead of learning from pedagogy, curriculum, uh, episodic, I'm getting into something more experiential, contextual, case-based, live. So that's a change, okay. But that change creates more change. Because that changes my relationship with the entire system that I'm working with. That changes the kind of people I get to interact with. That changes my confidence, my spirit, my ability to absorb that, my ability to come back and live that experience, it changes the way I deal with the community, it changes the way the community deals with me, and uh, because it's rhythmic and you can get into multiple echo clinics again and again, it gives me, so it's a change that creates more change. 
It's not just that the way of training changed, but the life of the healthcare professional is different after that change. And so to just give you a simple example, saying it's a change that creates more change. And so the question is, how do we do more of this? And like Sanjeev mentioned, when he said, let's do a billion, I said, why not two? Uh, because trust me, doing two billion is as hard as doing a billion. So why not two billion? Uh, but the real question is that if you have to work with improving access and effectiveness of healthcare for two billion people, and we have to do that potentially through a network of 100 million healthcare professionals across the world, then obviously it cannot be linear, because if we did some linear mathematics, we will not get done in our lifetimes. It has to be exponential. And what we mean by that is, we have to create this cascade effect. I don't know how many of you are fond of playing with dominoes, but the question is that if you went by the physics of dominoes, a domino is capable of toppling another domino which is one and a half times its size, right? So a five millimeter domino in 13 steps can knock down a 100 pound domino, and in 29 steps can knock down the Empire State Building because it multiplies. And so that's what the question that I have been sort of working with, saying, what does it take to create that order of multiplication to be able to really spread the idea of echo? Because the infrastructure of echo, the process of echo, is not the real power. The real power is the fundamental idea of echo, how you think about this. And to create this exponential change, I believe the beginning is in the values that we hold dear to our heart. That's where it begins. It doesn't begin with some science and some technology and some IT and some you know, software and, and processes. It begins with what we hold dear in our heart. And when we started understanding patterns in driving exponential change, three important values stood out. One very big underlying value or underlying belief is that we believe in the agency of people. We believe that the people we work with and the people who are on the ground driving transformation of health want to exercise their agency, want to be, be strengthened, to be able to do on their free will what's right for the communities that they're serving, want to do what's right for the people that they're serving. And our objective is to amplify the agency of all the people who are trying to make a difference in health or even intersectional areas of health. It's not only about health, but it's about all the things that intersect with health. Health is not an isolated issue. It is something that is deeply connected with many other systems of the society. So agency, how do we build agency? India is a country of 1.2 million healthcare workers, right? It's about 1.6 million doctors, potentially three and a half million nurses. What does it take to, to invoke the agency of this, this ecosystem? The second thing on which exponential change rests is the need to nurture dignity. The dignity of people that we are serving and the dignity of the people who are serving the people we want to serve because this asymmetry of knowledge has its implications on how people feel about themselves, about how good they feel about what they're doing and how capable they feel. What's the level of self-efficacy that comes in because of the role of dignity in our lives? And so how do we nurture dignity? And the third important facet is choice. Because in the end, if I have to ensure that the community that I am serving in my healthcare environment uh, I'm able to do my best, I should have the flexibility to exercise the right way to do it. I should be able to adapt, I should be able to change and, and modify so that the, what I'm learning is effective, useful. In the context, if I'm in the foothills of Himalayas and trying to deal with a certain complication, that requires me to adopt something vis-a-vis -vis if I was in a metropolis like New Delhi, or if I was in Nairobi, or if I was sitting in Sao Paulo. It's very different from how do I do things? While protocols may be standard, but I should have the ability to exercise my choice and do what's right for the people. So agency, dignity, and choice as the three fundamental building blocks where we begin our journey from. But then immediately comes the question of what really causes exponential effects? And all of you know it, it's networks. Echo is a classic example of building networks. You build your hubs and spokes and connect everyone and and build these networks, and, and it's a phenomenal network, and I always lose count, and Sanjeev always tells me what's the recent number. 1,080 hubs, that's a big thing. Let's give everyone a big hand, right? Uh, it's phenomenal, uh, because you know, I know in 2000 and 
17, you're about one-tenth the size potentially, so it's an exponential effect, right? You're talking about 100 to 1080. That's a huge transformation. But how does this happen is because networks have an ability to create this multiplication effects, and that's what you do. You create hubs, you create spokes, you connect them, and, and drive this transformation through networks. But I think it's important for us to also reflect that it's not only about building networks, it's about creating network effects. And I would like to pose to you three images in your mind. You could build a network which looks like a, like a broadcasting radio network. You remember the days when there would be, I'm still there, of course, radio programs, and you get this FM transmission, etc., where there's a center that's broadcasting, and everybody else is consuming, and maybe potentially further broadcasting. That's also a network. It's a broadcasting network. And it has its own potential of driving change because you are able to disseminate the message. And potentially in some situations, you would say that your network that you have built may have this broadcasting character, where there is some agency, a hub, which is taking the knowledge, broadcasting it across more hubs, and then into spokes. But then telecom networks are very different. Telecom networks are, the power of the network is that you have a phone, I have a phone, and we can talk to each other. And that's interesting, because now it's becoming bidirectional. And the more people have phones, the more useful the entire network is to me. So whereas in a broadcasting network, if you had a transistor and I had a transistor, I really don't care because your transistor is of no use to me. You want to listen to it, God bless you. But I'm going to listen to it if the program is good. But in a phone, if you don't have a phone, my phone is useless because who do I talk to? And that's an interesting question now for Echo saying, okay, if it was not a broadcasting network, if the hubs and the spokes were able to talk to each other, is there value in talking to each other? Do they care that the next healthcare center has echo or not, or has been on an echo or not? If they don't care, then it's like a radio broadcasting station, right? But if they care, because the knowledge exchange that can happen between two people who can talk to each other is valuable, then the effects start to multiply. And that is why telecom networks grow way faster than radio broadcasting networks. But then there's a third kind of network where, because you and I have a similar infrastructure, I don't really need to talk to Project Echo, but I can use the Echo way to do what I really want to do best with the community that I'm serving with my local networks, like, which is like the internet. Right? Have you ever tried to find out where are these things running and who's doing what? No. You want to do something, you want to set up a business, you want to form your community, you use the internet infrastructure, go ahead, form your community, do your thing, start your business, but the underlying construct is running on the same protocols. Still HTTP, HTML, URL, is the same underlying language, but I don't have to sign up to a Verizon, T-Mobile, whatever, whatever. I just have to figure out how to use this infrastructure. So. The ultimate network is the one where it, the effect is driven by the underlying infrastructure, but nobody is a bottleneck to scale. If you have to serve 2.6 billion people across this world, then we have to figure out what kind of a network we want to be. Do we want to be a radio station? Do we want to be a telecom network? Or do we want to be something as ubiquitous, as universal, as interconnected, that the idea of Echo can be picked up and exercised by people who really want to solve healthcare problems in their respective, wherever they are. That's a question for us. What's the role of hubs? What's the role of spokes? What's the role of super hubs? What's the role of Project Echo? And how is it going to evolve as we move towards serving a few billion people? And so that's the question that I grapple with a lot, and I would love for you to, I'm not obviously here to offer you answers, I would love for you to think about this. What is it that you think we should be if we have to serve? My ambition, we have to be sure that we can serve at least three and a half billion people who live at or below the poverty line in this world. For the rest, of course, ECHO should be useful, but we should not miss this fundamental question that we're dealing with three and a half billion people in this world who do not have access to proper health care because of the conditions that we are all in. Of course, it's getting worse. Um, then the second question comes saying, if we have this kind of a network, 
then should we be distributing a solution saying, here is my protocol, here is my process, here is my procedure, and let's push it out. And that works very well in a radio station. You have a program and you're saying it's 9.25 p.m. and now we're going to listen to blah, blah, blah. Is that the model? Or is the model that we distribute the ability to solve, which means that the nodes and its local ecosystems create their own approach and their own adaptation of the fundamental backbone or the protocols or the, or the knowledge and the information that you're sharing with them. How distributed is the ability to solve the problems? Because I'm sure you all aspire to, and I've seen some examples of it, actually quite a few examples, where your spokes eventually become hubs because they find their place and they grow up and they understand what to do. And so that has to happen more and more and more. And so if spokes have to become hubs and eventually potentially have the character of the super hubs and so on and so forth, then, then the question is the ability to solve is translating through the network and not the solution. What does that mean? How do you propagate the ability to solve? How do you propagate people's ability to form networks by their own, with their own ways of doing things? If I'm working in certain tribal areas, if I'm working in the Kirinyaga County of Kenya, I have to then figure out what to do in the context of this. And I should be able to work as if it was Sanjeev and the team. And if I have to gain that capability, then the ability to work like that has to translate. And not only the process and the standard method of replicating the idea of echo that has to transmit into the network. That requires us to build a different kind of infrastructure because you might have very well established processes, systems, protocols, etc. today to say, okay, you sign a replication agreement and then we work with you and we tell you how to do these things and we give you the tooling, we give you the mechanism and you go ahead and follow it, and we observe it for some time, and if it's working well, we say, great going, to a point saying, here are the building blocks, like Lego, right? Here are the building blocks, now you go make your toy. You go make what you think you want this to be. That's not easy. That's not as simple forward as saying, here is a, here is a doll, or here is a, you know, here's a fixed box of things. Giving out Lego bricks is very hard. Then the question comes is, how do you build the Lego bricks? And that is where technology starts to play a role. That's how the genesis of iEcho begins. One could think about iEcho as an application to handle a fixed, predefined echo process. Or one could imagine iEcho to be actually like a building block. Today you see it like a fire engine, but tomorrow if somebody else assembles it, it'll look like an ambulance. It's just that you see it like a fire engine. And that's okay. But how do you design that? And how do you, and I think the team at, at Echo and Karthik and the, and the entire uh, brain trust behind it have done a phenomenal job of actually building something with a set of building blocks so that as you evolve, as you scale, as you grow, you can then keep on morphing it. And more importantly, over time, give the ability to morph to the ecosystem so that they can find more ways and like you know today, there are Lego competitions and people do all sorts of weird things with Lego. And the reason is because it's flexible, right? And it's not flexible in a, like a Play-Doh. Play-Doh is also flexible. It's not flexible like Play-Doh. There is a structure. There is a certain fundamental construct to what it is. And, and it allows you to do certain things within a certain parameter of what's effective healthcare, what's good quality healthcare, how to ensure that it's effective, how do you measure its effectiveness, and so on and so forth. So it could be as flexible as saying, here is Play-Doh and go do what you want to do with it, or here's Lego bricks. Both have flexibility in a different way. And now when you start to think about iEcho as a, as a backbone, as your Lego bricks, then the question is, how do you exercise your ingenuity, your thinking, to come back and saying, well, I think I need to make a house out of this because in my community, that's what we need. Somebody else says I need to make a hotel out of it because in my community, that is what I need. Building blocks are shared, but the combinations of building blocks don't need to be shared. They have to be built based on experience because that's how all of us will find a way to create change that creates more change because it multiplies as it goes on over time. So when you look at IECO, my uh, excitement is, I don't see it like one SAP of Echo or look at a classical application of Echo, one more app or a portal of Echo. 
but I see it as a combination of building blocks that you see today. The next question then comes in, what's the role of data? Because today, you are obviously uh, looking at data to understand how things are performing, are we improving, measurement, evaluation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think when we think about exponential change, we have to think about how is data used to empower the people who are propagating the vision of ECHO? What's the role of data in empowering people? Because many a times data is used as a control structure. I want to know this. I want to know how many sessions happen. I want to know what's the quality of the sessions happen. I want to know the attendance. I want to know what's the degree of content. And so it's used as a mechanism for I want to know. Can we change that to you want to know what's happening. You want to know what you are doing. You are a healthcare professional in a village. What do you want to know? And how does the echo backbone tell you what you want to know, rather than how does it tell me who is operating the hub as to what I want to know? And I think that architecture is very important, and data plays a very, very important role in helping people improve what they want to do, where they want to go, what they want to know. And that's a very important evolution of how we should be looking at data um, and going forward, that it's not that it's a dashboard. I know that today, already, Sanjeev has been very, very generous in sharing how he uses the infrastructure, how he uses the data to be able to get a sense of how the movement is progressing. Super important, super critical. But I think we need to add that ability saying, what does it mean for a community health worker in, in some uh, district of a certain country? What data do they get out of what's happening in ECHO? Because it's, it's important to get the people that sense of empowerment, that they are able to understand what is happening to them, people like them, people around them, people who have similar challenges like them, and that is a very powerful force to involve people in the overall movement of ECHO. Lastly, it's time that we start to put our heads together and watch the role of artificial intelligence. We can always take this position saying, oh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a dark force and God knows what's going to happen with AI. And... But I'm saying, you know, you don't always have to fight boxing matches. Sometimes we have to learn how to fight judo. And the trick of judo is how to use the force of the opponent and make it achieve what we want to do. If AI is a force, which essentially is an unstoppable force because there are trillions of dollars behind it, so very hard to stop that force, then can we direct it in the direction of how we want to serve the community? And that's our, that's our genius. Our genius is to saying, how can we use it so that healthcare improves for the people who have zero access to healthcare? Capacity of healthcare workers improve for people who have no access to knowledge, who have no assistance, no support, no aid, and we have to put that to use there. And we have to do it in a thoughtful manner. And that is how the Apurva work was born, and we are very privileged that ECHO has been an extremely exciting partnership for us. I hope some of you had a chance to go outside and take a look. There is a setup today where we have the future of what Apurva would look like when it comes into iECHO already out on demonstration. But the idea that we have to make AI work for every community health professional that we work with. What does it mean? How do we ensure that it can work in their language, in their context, with the interfaces that they are comfortable with? And most importantly, with the knowledge of the communities that they are serving. Everybody is so excited about chat GPT and how wise it is, and it can clear the Harvard Med School examinations, etc. But trust me, chat GPT has no idea what happens in, in the parts of the world that we are actually worried about serving. It actually doesn't know. If you ask them a question saying, what's happening in, uh, in, in this village of Thailand, it will say, sorry, I don't know, because obviously it doesn't know. Uh, but our healthcare professionals know. So what does it take to get the community's wisdom and use that along with the power of AI to bring the transformation in the capacity and the capability of the healthcare professionals? And I think we have to work with that vision because this is, I, I always believe that all of us who work in the development sector, and I work with almost 100 organizations across 16 countries, most of us actually missed the telecom revolution. We came way late to think, oh, why can't we use SMS once SMS had been used for like decades? 
Uh, we missed the internet revolution. Internet came into the development language and technology came into development language way after it actually came in. We are at the juncture of where we should be leading how AI is used for driving development of any large social issue that we are working with. So I think this is the combination, this is the kind of set of issues that I would leave for you to think about. How to build a network that is self-propagating. The most scalable form of a network is when the energy of the network fuels the network. Otherwise, all of us will spend our lifetime raising resources to power up the network because we are trying to bring external resources to power up the network. It's very hard at scale. To serve two and a half billion people, we have to use the resources of the network to fuel up the network. So how do we think about networks? How do we think about distributing Lego bricks so that people can go ahead and build what they are trying to build? How do we ensure technology becomes a binding force and becomes a unifying backbone? What's the role of data? And how do we use it to empower people? And how do we ensure that we lead the AI journey in the service of the communities that we want to serve, rather than miss that bus and later on figure out, oops, now what do we do? Uh, because AI is actually not working for the communities. The combination of these things is what we call a societal thinking, so it's not rocket science. But the question is, if we take on ourselves, like Sanjeev has, to saying, we need to do something for, for a very large population at population scale, then probably some of these questions could be relevant to you. I'm super excited about the future, I'm deeply committed to ECHO, and would ensure that I would do my best to see what we can do to ensure that ECHO succeeds in every part of the world. And I believe that ECHO is an idea which is going to travel much faster than ECHO the organization. And I think that is the true test of scale. Thank you so much.